big picture uh, perspective on, on physics teaching and, and reform. And, and what I mean by that is really kind of looking at very broadly at, at research on learning, how that's given us guiding principles that actually you'll see explain why uh, much of these uh, these teaching innovations, you can sort of understand at a deeper level uh, why they're working. And having these underlying principles is very helpful because then it allows you to take some particular thing and apply it at a, at a different level, a different context, and so on, and see how to do it right in very much the same way that basic principles in physics allow us. You know, if you know conservation of energy, you go to a completely different situation, you know a lot about what you can do there. And I'll, I'll pick up on that. Uh, I, I mean, and these kinds of principles uh, can guide implementation, they can guide uh, assessment so on, and I'll pick up on the question that was just asked on the wrap-up, okay? They can guide uh, wrap, what should be in the wrap-up section, and you'll sort of see that emerging, but I'll just give you one one point that, that's become clear from this research that a lot of people neglect, which is that you really should review all of the incorrect thinking as, as probably as least as important, if not more important, than the correct thinking, so people can understand what's incorrect about the best. Important for feedback, it, it emerges really from the general feedback. Um, okay, so just very briefly, I mean, all of you should be convinced we need better physics education, and I see it as as like most people, for two big reasons. The one is just so we have a, a more scientifically literate population, make sensible decisions on things for democracy. And then the you know, all the workers, scientists, engineers, etc. that we need in the, for the modern economy. And the, to achieve these, you really need to have I would argue all students to think about, and then this is really sort of the educational goal, is to think about and understand science and how it's used like scientists and engineers in our context, like physicists think about physics. That doesn't mean they all have to become physicists, but, but when they come to your classroom, I'd say, you should be looking at it, this is one sort of guide of what you want to be measuring. Do they walk out of that classroom thinking about using physics more like a physicist does, did, than, uh, does than, than when, when they walked in? The nice thing is all the research says, if, if you target this goal, you get both of those at the same time. So that the same things that work for making more and better physicists also make more and better uh, informed public. And that's really what this slide is, is giving, is that over the past couple of decades, there's actually uh, research advances coming from three different areas. The cognitive psychologists who study how people think and learn, brain, you know, study how the brain works, and the college science classroom studies led by physics, physics education, and the results coming from these are, uh, are actually now coming together to give us a very nice consistent picture about what's important for achieving learning of complex uh, expertise like physics. And it shows really in that process the opportunity for how we can do much better. And so that's really what I'm going to cover today is this broad research on learning in the, in the putting it in the physics context. Starting with the first really critical question, which is what, what do we mean by we want students to think like physicists? What does that really mean? What do we know about how it's learned? Uh, then I'll talk a little about some evidence, just sampling some evidence from classroom studies uh, to support this. I'll then move on to some very broad, uh, just pulling together lots of research on the principles for effective 
teaching, focus a bit on, on specifically on the aspects of motivation, and then uh, I'll finally sort of tie this together at the end, looking at how this can actually play into thinking about changing and convincing other faculty that you might uh, interact with about how they're teaching and how this whole argument kind of can be used in that context. Now, I'm going to give very few references just because I don't want to fill it up with, you know, a, a phone book, but uh, all of this stuff there's lots of uh, research on, and I'll give some general references at the end you can uh, follow up with. So, let me start with this issue about what do we really mean when we say we want students to think like physicists, okay? What, what does that mean? Well, it turns out that this is an area where cognitive psychology has, has uh, provides a lot of help. Because cognitive psychology, com, psychologists have studied expertise uh, across a whole bunch of different fields. Uh, you know, musicians, scientists, chess players, etc. And they find out that there's certain consistent components across these human endeavors that make up expertise and there's certain consistent features about how expertise is acquired. And so I'm going to start with, okay, what makes up expertise in a very generic sense? Well, the first, all experts have a whole bunch of facts or knowledge in their discipline. That one's anybody could get. The others aren't so obvious. The second one is that in any given area, physics, music, chess, etc. Um, the experts in that area have a, a discipline a unique discipline specific organizational framework by which how they organize all their knowledge. And this these particular frameworks allow them to retrieve and apply that knowledge in a highly effective manner. Okay? And what goes into these mental organizational frameworks are, you know, recognizing and looking for some complex patterns, relationships, and what we talk about is scientific concepts, I would argue, is really the way scientists in a given area take a whole bunch of pieces of information, organize that together in certain ways, and so that when faced with a problem, they can search through very effectively to see what information applies as you so then the third fundamental aspect of expertise is the ability to monitor your own thinking uh, and learning in your, in your area of expertise. So what that means is if you're working on a problem, you're actually able and, and are asking yourself, you know, do I understand this? Is this a sensible way to be solving this problem? And an expert has resources that they're calling on to answer those questions and then change what they are doing according to what that answer is. Now, what the research shows is, okay, these show up in all areas of expertise. It also says that these are fundamentally new ways of thinking. No human brain comes in as an expert in anything, okay? Uh, and that, in fact, everybody uh, requires many hours, it's actually many thousands of hours of intense practice at doing these things, at these kinds of thinking, before they develop this high level expertise. Um, and what's now becoming increasingly clear as people can start looking at the brain more detail, is in fact the brain is doing major changes in that process. I think it's, it's becoming quite clear that it's this limit of how much time and effort is required is basic biology. You're going to do a bunch of rewiring in there uh, on the brain to actually have it become an expert brain. And it's very different from that brain that started out. Now, just as a little digression, I think one of the real challenges is in changing how people think about teaching is that for our own brains, we don't have a control. We don't have, you know, here's a fixed brain and here's our brain that we get to compare with all the time. We've only got one brain. And so most 
you know, faculty members, when they're thinking about this, they think they got the same brain they had when they were a freshman. And so they don't. That's, it's really been radically rewired, but they simply don't have the perspective to understand that. And that's why for most everybody, it seems like learning is mostly getting knowledge into an existing brain because we don't have that, that background perspective. Anyway, um, so that's the reality is, is your effective teaching is really changing brains. So I said this takes thousands of hours of intense practice. I mean, it's monotonic, so you know, you, even if you don't have those students for a thousand hours, you want to have at least the first hundred hours that you can get in your class that they're going to walk out. It's moving them on up that curve of expertise. And so what goes into that learning of expertise? What kind of practice goes in there? This is something that the reason there's also been a lot of research on, particularly by somebody named Anders Erickson, who's sort of my here this afternoon. And he finds that there's certain, across all these areas of expertise, and there's, again, certain fundamental generic components. Um, and the first is you have to have, the learner has to have challenging but doable tasks or questions. Okay? So, so it turns out that doing a whole lot of pretty routine questions doesn't develop expertise, no matter how many hours you put in on it. It has to be really hard, just really pushing your your levels of capability, but if, if but not impossible. Uh, and these tasks, they don't have to just be hard. They really have to have a very explicit focus on practicing expert thinking. And so, uh, just to give you a few examples of things that. Uh, would show up that these are generic to all sciences, but certainly they apply to physics. They should, they should sound familiar to you. Uh, you know, there's a set of concepts and, and mental models, but even more important than that, and this is the part that usually gets neglected in the teaching, is these sophisticated criteria by which, if you're given a new context, you make decisions about which of those mental models apply or don't apply uh, and why. Okay? Uh, and recognizing relevant and irrelevant information is only wrong. That's, that requires very complex uh, pattern recognition systems, actually. And then this whole process of self-checking and sense-making and going through procedures and your answers, etc. Okay? So these, these are the kind of things that are critical to make up expert thinking. And in particular, and this is the one that gets probably most neglected, is how these play into making decisions in problem solving when you have limited information. This is what experts do, essentially. They make, dis they make the right decisions. And so if you want to turn a student, you know, develop expertise, they have to be also practicing these decisions that Criteria to use for them. So, so you know, if you, if I now let you go off and think for three or four hours, you could sit and think how to map that over onto your introductory physics course, third year level physics course, etc. I mean, I realize I'm sort of rushing through this, but but you you ought to be thinking in those terms because they really do apply everywhere. 